questions. What inspired these three men to commit such awful crimes and how can it be stopped from happening again? Well, to discuss how Islamist extremism can be tackled, I'm joined by Mohammed Khalil, the founder of Islamix, an organisation that aims to promote a deeper understanding between Muslims and non-Muslims. Also alongside him, Usama Hussain, the head of Islamic studies at the Quilliam Foundation, uh, the think tank, and Dili Hussain, a journalist for Five Pillars UK, which is a Muslim news website. Um, good morning to you, gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for coming down to see us here on Sky News. Um, Mohammed Khalil, if I could come to you first. Enough is enough, said the Prime Minister, and this morning so many people saying something has to be done. What can be done to stop these kind of attacks happening? Well, I agree. Enough is enough, and our thoughts and uh, prayers are with the victims, first and foremost. I think enough is enough because we are double victims as a Muslim community. I was worried on Saturday night because my daughter goes to university near here. My first fear was, I hope she's not walking the bridge. And so we were trying to locate her. Then, on top of that, as a Muslim, I have to face the backlash of people saying, well, you're responsible. And I'm worried about my daughter being knocked down by a van, yet I'm getting all these people accusing me of things. So enough is enough for us as well. I think the Prime Minister is right. We do need those difficult conversations. And those difficult conversations means that we've got to put everything in the frame and say, Whatever it takes to solve this problem, let's solve it. And unfortunately, one of those things that the government don't want to talk about is foreign policy. One of the things that the authorities don't want to talk about is these people have been reported. They have been reported to the authorities, and yet they commit these heinous acts. Why, is those, why are those reports not being taken action? Uh, Osama, I'll come to you. We're talking about what more can be done in communities. And the communities secretary, Sajid Javid, wrote a piece in one of the newspapers today saying the Muslim community does carry an extra responsibility. Of course, the Muslim community is saying these attackers are not Muslims, they're murderers and terrorists. But these embarrassing conversations that we just alluded to there, the Prime Minister was talking about, Muslim communities need to be having them. Yes, absolutely, on, on two fronts. One is the underlying extremist ideas which motivate these people, which is to believe that Muslims cannot coexist with people who are not Muslim, who cannot live in a non-Islamic country and have to be opposed to Western values like democracy, for example. This is very dangerous and it pits these extremists as uh, in a world of Islam or believers versus non-believers and dehumanizes believers and non-believers, which means it's okay to go and kill them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Muslim communities have to get behind counter-terrorism strategies, including the PREVENT program. We've had extremist groups trying to derail PREVENT. We've had naive politicians saying dangerous and irresponsible things like scrap PREVENT. If you scrap PREVENT, you'll get more attacks like this, not less. Sure, you can uh, repair the mistakes of PREVENT, improve the strategy, but generally, as, as, as Khalil said, Muslims suffer also, and Muslim communities uh, should be actually at the forefront of weeding out this uh, terrorist cancer in our midst. Yeah. Um, Dilly, uh, from your point of view, what do you think, where do the resources need to go? I mean, we hear a lot of experts saying more police officers within communities gaining their trust, um, knowing that they have someone to go and talk to, a policeman they see every day, and other people are saying it's up to the communities, whether it be the Muslim community or the wider community, you know, the neighbours in, in your block of flats. I mean, we can, I mean, there is an issue with regards to police cutbacks. I mean, we've been seeing the to and fro between Mr Corbyn and Ms May with regards to, um, you know, decreased number of policing and funding and so forth. But these, in my personal opinion, are symptomatic issues. Um, I'd like to kind of echo what uh, Mohammed Khalil said. I mean, we need to look at these issues holistically. Um, we've been here before. We've had 7-7, we've had Woolwich, we had Manchester, and now, unfortunately, we've had London Bridge. We ask the same questions every time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and we need to understand what are the motivations of the perpetrators, right? Now, whilst foreign policy cannot be the sole reason for this, but nor can theology or ideology, we have to understand where do these things play in, in the order of one's journey to carry out these acts of atrocities. And there's been a, a very frequent question, can the Muslim community do more? Absolutely, they can do more, but they must be allowed to do more. And what I mean by that is to allow scholars and activists to address some of these issues, because as soon as they be censored or fear being labeled, there's a disconnect and there's a vacuum in knowledge. As soon as there's a vacuum in knowledge, then youth will seek knowledge elsewhere, i.e. the internet. Mm. Well, it, it's interesting, isn't it, because we talk about these ideologies that these attackers have, this warped Islamic ideology, and we talk about communities uh, having open and frank conversations. But the men that carried out these attacks on Saturday night 
how can you get inside their heads? You may have, you know, one interpretation of a religion, mm. but these are murderous terrorists. Absolutely. How, how can you get inside their heads? Well, if they were following the religious ideology, we're in the holy month of Ramadan. We're in the holy month of Ramadan, and the time they committed these heinous acts, we were actually in prayers. If they were Muslims, they would have been actually in the mosque in, in what we call Taravi prayers at that time. Um, the other point to make is that I think, you know, this Western, uh, we, Western values and rejection of them, mm. what about countries that, in the Western sphere that don't get touched? You know, Ireland, Luxembourg, look, at the end of the day, it's not simply, it's too simplistic to say they reject our Western values. It's not that. I think it's a combination of things. Um, disaffection from society, um, they're disaffected from our own community. So these people would have gone along that bridge and looking for Muslims as well. They abhor everything. It's just them versus the rest of the world, which includes Muslims that don't adhere to their ideology. And Asama, a lot of this goes on behind closed doors because we heard the Prime Minister yesterday talking about the internet and the changing face of terrorism and what these men can do. I mean, there was uh, Islamic State propaganda readily available on the internet, even this morning. Um, it was a poster showing a, a white van and knives, these low-tech plots that they're encouraging people to take part in. So even if the community is interacting with these people on a daily basis, they don't know what goes on behind closed doors on what they're doing on their computer. Do, does technology and technology companies, do they have a part to play in this? Yes, certainly, of course, technology companies can do more. And in fact, they actually do a lot. You know, Twitter takes down 2,000 accounts every single day. Mm of ISIS terrorists promoting this kind of propaganda. But of course they can do more. Uh, but I, th I think it's wrong to simply blame technology. Okay, that's deflecting the blame. Technology is a tool and people will find other technology if you crack down on one or the other. Uh, it, it is actually the ideas and getting through to people's hearts and minds. I mean, the reports coming out of Barking saying the attacker with the arsehole shirt, you know, would buy ice cream for the local kids. And one of the kids went back to one of his parents and said, Mummy, I want to be a Muslim. It's that, it's that kind of, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it, it's grooming young children, young adults. Well, people are entitled to express their faith, etc. but somebody needed to speak to him, and he was probably disconnected from his local mosque, a, a loving sure. imam, loving Muslim leader, right. because this, this always, guy was listening though. to a hate preacher. Not it it is also reported he was listening to a hate preacher whose YouTube videos have been uh, available and have been promoted by extremist groups in this country. Really, they're not always disconnected, though, because uh, um, people who are living in the same tower block as uh, some of those arrested weren't saying, oh, they were trying to convert people in the community. We didn't, you know, we, we found something suspicious about them. A lot of them were saying, this is somebody we interacted in on, with a, on a daily basis. Right. He was a nice guy. He always had a chat. He asked after my wife, after my kids. He I mean, was, a, he, you know, he I mean, was an integral part of that community, setting up a neighbourhood watch group. I mean, look, there's only so much members of the community can do. What goes on behind closed doors is something that's beyond uh, the community's reach. But I think it's, what is important is language and narrative. So when you mentioned Islamic terrorism, I personally think that's the wrong terminology because we've had the IRA. At the peak of the IRA bombing campaign here, Lord Mountbatten was killed. Um, the entire cabinet was nearly killed. They were mortaring up Downing Street. We didn't hear about Catholic extremism. We didn't hear about Republican extremism. When did we bring peace to the streets of Britain? When we acknowledged that our actions in Northern Ireland was having a knock-on effect here. Again, let's look at it holistically. Let's not look at it in an insular way where we blame one thing over another. You know, at the end of the day, these individuals are going for a journey. And the vast majority of Muslims understand that we coexist here with our wider non-Muslim public. We've got a, a covenant of security here. And this is the mainstream Islam reason, and I'm sure my co-panelists will agree. You know, the vast majority of Muslims understand that you just can't do these kind of things. Yeah, we've got less than a minute left. Yeah, no, Relating totally back agree. to what you were, were talking to earlier, I was talking to a Muslim couple yesterday. We were talking about the attacks, and they were saying exactly the same thing you were. They were worried about the kids. Religion didn't Absolutely. even come into our conversation. But we've got um, less than a minute. Quick. One final thought from each of you on what can be done. What, it, what would you say what to the Prime Minister? What we need to understand is these people want to split mainstream Muslims from Western values. Mm. They, it, they really want to cause this war between Muslims and non-Muslims, and because they're not part of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. We've got to remain united as we have. Very proud of the way yeah. the community has re been resilient. We've got to remain resilient and not let the extremists win. We have to continue co contextualizing Islam in, in the modern world, in the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Covenant of security is a medieval religious idea. The modern idea is citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever background you are, whatever religion you are, you are equal citizens of the nation state. The Ottomans introduced it in the 19th century. And so we have to continue that for Muslims to feel and be part of Britain, equal to everybody else.
Delhi fighter fought me. Beyond re reactionary rhetoric and na narratives behind ideologies, we need to look at situations and we need to look at the motives of these individuals and a, and a repetitive motive that keeps on coming out from the perpetrators of foreign policy grievances. That's the elephant in the room. Let's, let's take heed and look at what we can do to prevent and make our streets safer. Gentlemen, excellent contribution this morning. Thank, Thank you so you much for coming to see us Thank here you. at you, London Bridge. Uh, we're going to take a break now.